when I was growing up, the, the first entry-level place of jokes, and I love comedy, I love laughing. Matter of fact, Ecclesiastes 3 that we're going to look at today talks about a time to laugh. I love laughing. So the entry-level joke is kind of when you're teaching kids is knock-knock jokes because every kid can participate and kind of get it. And so, and then, and then when we had kids, we did knock-knock knock jokes. And I was asking some parents today, do you still teach kids knock-knock jokes? And they they seems to be still a standard thing. So if you know what a knock-knock joke is, I'm going to do one right now, one of my favorite ones for you, and I'm going to ask you to do it with me. If you don't know what a knock-knock joke is and how to go from here, uh, talk with us afterwards. We'll have a prayer for you, and we'll explain what a knock-knock joke is, okay? Uh, but uh, this is what I call the Ecclesiastes chapter 3 knock-knock joke, okay? It sets up for Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Everybody Ready? You going to participate in the cars? You ready? Here we go. I'll start. Ready? Knock, knock. Impatient cow. Moo! See how that works? See, you jump in before the impatient cow. So here's the idea. It's about timing. It's all about timing. And Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's a time for everything. But it's not just saying the kind of things that happen in life. It's saying learn God's timing. Work within the timing of the living God. Here's what I've learned through my years of life. The more I watch God's timing and cooperate with God, the better things go for me. And the more I see God's timing and disregard it or do it my own way, like, oh God, I have a better idea, it goes worse for me. It rarely goes good for me when I'm not walking God's timing because God set things up in a natural way. Think about it this way. Imagine a farmer, and this farmer has a large field, and they look out the window one day, it's the middle of the winter, and there's like a foot and a half of snow covering their fields. The, the ground is like rock hard frozen. And that farmer says, you know, I know that usually we plant when the, the ground is soft and there's no snow, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to be a maverick. I'm going to have a little fun here. I'm going to go out and I'm going to plant my field right now. And they got to clear a foot and a half snow off of all these massive fields. they got to take a chisel and break through, and then they throw some seeds into rock hard ground. You don't have to be like a you know, professional person in the ag industry and in Salinas to know how that's going to go. It's not going to go well. Why? Because they're fighting against the rhythm of how God has set up the world. They're, they're pushing back against it. Now imagine a farmer who, who waits, and when the ground is warm and soft, it's the right time. They've, they've watched the rhythm of life. They've watched the rhythm of how the world works, and they plant in accordance to that time, and they're going to have a harvest. It's going to go much, much easier. That's what, I believe that's what Ecclesiastes is, is saying to us. He's saying, watch God's timing. Move in step with the Spirit and how God is moving, and you'll find that life goes so much better. We're talking about, you know, what makes life meaningful. Last week we learned that sometimes what we, if we put as the most meaningful thing possessions or accomplishments or, or, or um, you know, projects, and we say, well, I want those become the most important thing to us. We're going to find out that they aren't. And we're going to end up saying, meaningless, meaningless, all that I've done is meaningless, striving after the wind, like Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. But when we stay in line with the Spirit, we can say, meaningful, meaningful, Christ is meaningful. We can find meaning in our lives. Well, today we're talking about finding meaning as you learn to walk in step with God's timing. And so listen to these words from Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I want you to notice that, that all the different aspects of life that are mentioned here. Ecclesiastes 3, beginning of verse 1. There is a time for everything. A season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to harvest, to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time of COVID. It doesn't say that, but it says a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. That's driven, that's driven some of you crazy. Some of you are like, you're big huggers. And that's been tough. A time to search and a time to give up searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent. And a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. 
a time for war, and a time for peace. This is God's word, painting this picture of, of God's timing, God's hand. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today, that we will discover your timing, that we will not fight against how you've made the world, how you've made us, but that we would step in with your spirit and find the joy and blessing of not trying to break through hard ground, but waiting for those moments when the timing is right. Speak to us, teach us, and give us a new passion to walk in step with your leading by your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in my years as a Christian, I have learned something about, and it's a great theological word, about God's sovereignty. God is sovereign. He rules over all things. And I've learned that God is sovereign. I can look at the world, I can look at my life, I can look, look at situations and go, it's falling apart, it's coming, I mean, it's just, everything's going, you're just down the tubes. We've all felt that at moments. But the more I've learned of God's sovereignty, even in those moments I say, it may look like things are falling apart, but I know who's on the throne. And I know who holds my life. And I can walk with trust in him. I've learned that in so many ways. As a pastor here at Shoreline in Monterey, one of the greatest challenges in this area is people transitioning. People are leaving all the time because people come with the military. You know, they, and, and you know, Ecclesiastes talks about you know, ways to greet people, ways to say goodbye to people. There's a lot of that here. And so when we, when we have a person leave who's really gifted and really engaged in serving faithfully, they always leave an opening. There's, and you're like, oh, what are we going to do if that person leaves? They, you know, they help run a camera, or they sing on the worship team, or, or they work with children. It's going it's to leave a space. Well, just a while back, Brittany, and Brittany has been one of our singers on the stage here. She's on our staff. Well, she was on our staff, but she volunteered as a singer and was up here probably two or three times a month leading us in worship all through the time of COVID. And their family's been called to move, and they've moved out of the area. And it's like, well, then how do you respond? Oh, my gosh. Now we're, we're not going to have Brittany anymore. There's, we're not going to have a person to, and, and you know, the, the week that all that transition was happening that same week. Sherry, my wife, who works with people who do like our, our spiritual gifts tests and our, and our spiritual markers, we do different assessments and people can come and kind of learn how to grow in their faith and take steps forward in different areas. Well, Sherry met with somebody who shared with her, you know, I've, I've sung my whole life, but I've never sung on a worship team. I've sung in choirs and different things. I've never sung on a worship team. And she never had until this morning. She was standing right here, Lauren, Right? And the, the, week, the week that Brittany was being called away was the week that Sherry and her had that conversation, and Sherry said, oh, by the way, God's, God is, God's timing. You get the, the message? Do you trust in God? Do you look to him and trust him? And so I want to walk with you through Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I want to begin in verse 1, and it just kind of gives the big picture. There is a time for everything, and a season a season, the right season, the right time, right? For every activity under the sun, under the heavens. I saw a poster years ago, and I've seen it since then a number of times, a poster of this passage, of all the things that there's a time for. But when I read it, because I knew the passage, I read this poster, and I'm like, oh, there's a time that, wait a minute. They, they pulled a couple lines out they didn't like for the poster. You're not supposed to do that with the Bible, by the way. You're supposed to leave it all there. But on this poster, they pulled out a couple of the, of the verses. And a, a, time, a time for war. They didn't like that when they pulled that one out. But we're going to cover the whole passage today. We won't go into depth at all, but I want you to give a big picture and some life lessons for walking in God's timing. So we're going to walk in God's sovereignty and God's timing. And that's, and that's a lot of life, is knowing where God's leading and how God's leading in this season, in this moment of time. Years ago, Sherry and I uh, were at, at, with this group of people. We had just a big group. We were meeting of people for like this tour thing we were going to do. And uh, Sherry had just started doing some speaking at different churches, different places, and people really loved her communication. My wife has got a very a gift for communicating with authenticity and passion, loves the word, and people were saying, you should, you should be like a speaker, you should travel around and speak and stuff. And on this, when we met this group of people, one of them was this kind of well-known national woman who spoke all over the world. So she and Sherry got talking, and she asked Sherry some questions. Sherry, you know, tell me, how old are your kids? And tell me about the season of your life. And this woman just listened. And after a while, she said, and it was very wise, she said, you know, Sherry, a time will come for that. But I'm not sure it's now. She wasn't telling Sherry no. She was just saying, Sherry, watch the seasons. Watch the timing. And Sherry has had those opportunities to speak from Perth, Australia. I mean, she's spoken around the world. But for a number of years, she looked and she didn't feel like it was the right timing. It was the right thing, but not the right time. Everybody following? And so how do we follow God's timing? Well, let's walk through this text. Verse 2. 
There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. Beginnings and endings. Here's lesson number one. If you're a note taker, this is in your Shoreline app. It's on your outline if you want to write something down. Lesson number one. You can, there's a space to write this down. We honor God when we refrain from controlling life at the start and at the end. We honor God when we don't try to control everything in life from the beginning to the end. There's times where God gives life and we want to control the timing of things at the beginning and the end of life. And so I want to talk about that for a moment and I want to challenge each person to really open their heart to what God wants to say to you, specifically about life at the beginning and honoring life at the beginning. Uh, we found out uh, a while back that our oldest son, Zach, and his wife, Christine. Zach and Christine, Zach was a pastor here, and Christine worked here at Shoreline Church. In the, she was our, uh, was our uh, hospitality coordinator. And they met here, fell in love, got married. Years, some years ago, they wanted to start having a family. It was a really rough process, and they weren't able to, and it was kind of a, a long, complicated process. But a while back, about nine months ago, uh, they were able to get pregnant Things moved forward and progressed forward. And as I thought about that little boy, Kel, K-E-L-L, -L, it's, a, it's a Celtic name, it's an Irish name, Kel Ryan Harney. As I thought about it, I've been praying for Kel since I knew he was in Christine's womb. And he was my grandson. Hadn't met him yet. They still hadn't seen him yet. But I need to tell you, over the last nine months, that was my grandboy. That was my grandson. And then two days ago, he decided to come from, three days ago, he decided to come from inside to outside, and we get to see him, so we've seen pictures of him now. He's still my grandson. Now we can see him and see his cute little cheeks and stuff. So we're celebrating that, but I, I want you to hear a couple passages from the Bible that talk about life. And I, I want to share these with you uh, because I believe that God wants to speak to our hearts. And I, was, and I will say this to everyone here. I don't believe I have the strength or the power to change it in anyone's mind or anybody's heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Word of God speaks truth to us. So I'm, I'm going to read three passages, and I want you just to reflect on life at the beginning, God's timing, and how we're involved with that. All right? So listen to these words from Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13. The psalmist writes this as a prayer to God. So the psalmist is talking to God about himself. And he says to God, God, you created my inmost being. God, you knit me together in my mother's womb. That is so intimate. He says, God, you, you knit me. You made me together. You made me in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. He's talking about himself. He says, God, your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Psalm 139, verse 15. He uses these, th th this, is, this is called poetic synonymous parallelism. It's a poetic language, both lines saying the same thing, making a point. And the point is, he's talking about his creation in the womb of his mother. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. God, your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I love that. If you turn over to Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah, the prophet, is talking about his call to ministry. Now, I can tell you about my call to ministry. I was 15, almost 16, because the day I became a Christian was the day God called me to ministry. Literally, within an hour of becoming a Christian, from an atheistic home, from an hour of becoming a Christian, I knew I was called to be a pastor. But this is Jeremiah talking about when God called him to be a prophet. Listen to these words from Jeremiah 1, verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying... Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is God speaking to Jeremiah. God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. When did God call Jeremiah to be a prophet? In his mother's womb. And then one more passage. And this one is just amazing and fun and incredible. Uh, this is the account of the first time Jesus, the Messiah, met John the Baptist. They were actually cousins. Their moms knew each other. So Mary is pregnant with Jesus, and Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. All right? So now they're going to meet each other. These two women are going to meet each other. They're both pregnant, and they're going to meet. So this is when Jesus and John meet each other for the first time, is when their moms come together. So look, follow this in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 39. 
At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now watch what happens with the women, but watch, watch, watch what happens with the babies. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb. John the Baptist jumps in the womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, Elizabeth exclaimed, Blessed are you, Mary, among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. For why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? That baby in you is my Lord. It's Jesus Christ. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. The first time John the Baptist and Jesus met, they were in their mother's womb. And it was kind of a Holy Spirit hoedown experience where the God's moving. She's filled with the Spirit. The babies are kind of jumping around. Incredible. And so, so I, will, I will say to you, in this confusing world that we're in, you don't need to listen to me. Listen to God's Word. And honor life at the beginning and honor life at the end. Sometimes we want to end life before it's God's timing. And God may want us to be around for a little longer just to show what it looks like to hold on to Jesus through a tough ending. But we have to be careful. We have to honor life because, because God is sovereign. He's the giver of life. I'll, I'll give a little twist for you that I, I think you would find interesting. I also think that sometimes at the end of life, we might even hang on when God is saying it's time to come home. We might fight. It was 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there weren't all these ways to hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. And I think sometimes as human beings, we cling to life. And if you're a follower of Jesus, when you should know that when this life ends, man, the hard part's over. <laughs> the good part begins. And so we need to honor life. So here's a question for you. How can we honor life from the start to the end? How do we honor life? We celebrate life. We encourage people who adopt and who foster children. And who care for children. We care for single moms and support them. We don't just honor life at the beginning, very beginning. We honor life all the way through, beginning to end. Followers of Jesus should honor life in every way possible. We give dignity at the end of a life. At Shoreline we have things, we don't have funeral services here. We have celebrations of life. And we get together and acknowledge that there's a sorrow in losing a person, but we celebrate a life lived for Jesus. There's a time to be born and a time to die. And then verse 3 says this. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. Here's the second lesson. We honor God when we dare to battle and overcome that which stands against his will. There's times where we need to go to war, we need to battle, and we actually have to kill the things that are standing in the way of what glorifies God. Where there's sin in our life, the Bible talks about putting death to sin and coming alive in Christ. It can talk about standing against evil in this world. When there's profound evil, followers of Jesus should stand against it. During the Nazi Holocaust, when millions of people, of all sorts of people, were being slaughtered and, and, and locked up and killed, one of the people that stood and fought against it was a guy by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you don't know the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, it's worth reading, his story. He wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship, What It Cost to Follow Jesus, which is one of the most profound Christian books I think ever written. He was a young pastor... He saw what was happening in Germany and around the world. And he stood against Hitler as a German pastor. He spoke up. He stood against it. He was thrown into a concentration camp. And this young, passionate Christian pastor died about a day or two before they released the particular concentration camp that he was in. He gave his life to stand and to fight against those things which were evil and wrong. And there's times where Christians stand and fight. It's knowing God's timing. It's asking God to lead you and to guide you and to direct you. So here's a question for you. What needs to die so that the life of Jesus can rise up in you? There's a time to kill. And sometimes there's things in our list. There's attitudes inside of us that should die. There's motives that should be put in the grave. Sometimes there's, there's behaviors or patterns in our life that don't honor Jesus. And there's times we just need to say, that needs to end. That needs to die. God, is this your timing? I would, I would dare to say, if every one of us would be very quiet before the Lord and say, Lord, is there something in my life, an attitude, a pattern, a behavior, something that it's time for that to die? 
I think if we ask God, God would put something on our hearts. As a matter of fact, even before we ask the question, we might even be able to say, I already know what it is, Lord, because you've been like nudging me for weeks or months. It's time, it's time, it's time, and I keep doing it my way. And like I told you when I started this message, when I, when I, when I try to do things my way instead of God's way, it never goes well. And so I would challenge you, if there's things in your life that you need to say, I've got to put an end to it, there needs to be a death in my life, there's a habit I really like, but it's killing me, I need to kill it first. Following me? There's behaviors that are destructive. God, it needs to come to an end. Let God speak to you. Let God challenge you. We continue on in verse 4. We read these words. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Lesson number three. We honor God when we let ourselves feel and express deep pain and intense joy. We honor God when we let ourselves feel and express deep pain and intense joy. Each one of us is wired differently. And so some people, some people, the way their feelings work, they keep it a little closer, you know, they little, play it a little close to the vest. Sometimes their joy, they're joyful, but it's kind of like joy kind of here, and a little bit of, you know, so they're, they'll, they'll be sad, but it's kind of here. And other people, like, their joy is like, wow! It's, it's like their joy is, you just, you can hear it two blocks away. Their joy is just like, oh, out there. And when they're sad, man, they wear it out there. I'm not saying we should all be that, you know, expressed a certain way, but the depth of our joy and the depth of our sorrow. We honor God in those times when we're sorrowful that we let ourselves be sad. And say, so, so, oh, pull yourself together. Say, so, well, Ed, this is just a hard time. We honor God when there's joy that we will lift up that joy and let other people rejoice with us because that's what Christians do. We rejoice together. There's incredible value in mourning together and going through grieving together. Last Sunday, right after the service, after I had finished the second service on Sunday, I taught a class, a new members class, and there were people in my class in the room and there were people at home on a couple of monitors. And they, they, so there were some on Zoom and there were some in the room. And we're, that's called a hybrid learning experience. So as we're doing the class, I'm teaching in the youth room over here, and I keep hearing this kind of clanking behind me. So I turned around, and one of the monitors was there. So I was thinking, did somebody have their mic off? And they kind of kept, there's like something clanking behind me. So I turned around, and then I saw Terry Davis, a guy in our church. Terry and Betsy lead a, lead a ministry at Shoreline called, called Grief Share. And it's a ministry for people going through grieving times. And so I turned around and saw him kind of through the curtains at the back of the stage. And I, and I was just talking to the whole class about how when you become part of a church, God's going to surprise you with ways that you can serve and bless others in the ministry of the church. Well, I saw Terry, and it just felt appropriate. I said, Terry, can you come out here for a second? He came out. It wasn't planned, but he just kind of came out and joined me on the stage where I was teaching. And I said, Terry, I said, you and Betsy are here today to do grief share, right? And he says, yeah, we got a grief share group. Now, you have to know the backstory. When they came to Shoreline Church, their son Nick was a, a young man and loved Jesus, growing in his faith. But a number of years later, when he was a senior in college, at Westmont College, his last year, walking with Jesus, loved Jesus, in an accident, a motorcycle accident, and he died. And for the next two or three years, they went through deep mourning and deep grief. And they let themselves grieve, and they let themselves deal with the sadness of all of that. And then they actually came and said, listen, we'd like to start a ministry at Shoreline called Grief Share for people that are going through those times of grief and we'd like to pull them together and walk them through a process of just praying and processing and just walking through their grief together. And that ministry has continued and flourished ever since. There's almost always a new grief share class going on because there's always new people that are going through a time of grieving. And, 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 but I'll tell you something also. When I spend time with Terry and Terry's become a friend through the years, we actually were with them that night that they got the news and have walked with them ever since then and become dear friends with them. And, and, and as I was talking to Terry, I realized uh, probably 50% of the time I see Terry and we're together, we talk about Nick. Nick comes up, even though it's been years now since he died. There's still great joy and memories of him, but there's also sorrow. We as a church, as God's people, need to walk together in those times of joy and celebrate in joy and mourn together in sorrow. And at the end of the service today, if you need prayer, if you've got a great joy and you want somebody to rejoice with you, go up the stairs here for prayer or get online and join us for prayer. And if you have a, if you have a great burden or a great joy, whatever it is, let us pray with you because that's being the body of Christ together. So here's a question for you. What pain or joy have you been holding back and how can you unleash it? Is there a pain that you just go, I don't want to deal with it. And how can you share that with somebody else and maybe even join in a, in a grief share group or just talk with someone and pray with someone about that. And then what joys can you talk about and celebrate joys because that's what we do together in God's timing. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 5. Just continuing on here. 
Verse 5 says this. There's a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. There's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. In the ancient Middle East, greetings were very outward and very, you know, there was hugs, there was kisses, there was warmth, there was connection. Still is in a lot of parts of the Middle East. In this time of COVID, the whole world has changed. But I hope that very, very soon, there is something about human connection, human touch, warm greetings. And so, uh, a time to refrain, a time to refrain from embracing. I, I hope that we can really give that kind of warm welcome. So here's lesson number four. We honor God when we welcome people well, and say goodbye well. It honors God in our time when we welcome people well. When people come to Shoreline, we want to give a warm welcome. For some people, this, it's the warmest welcome they'll get all week long. That's maybe sad, but it's, it's true. We want people to know that they are welcome, they're loved, they matter. And so we want to be warm in how we welcome people. And when we say farewell to people, we want to do it well. I recognize early on as a pastor at Shoreline that people would just disappear. They'd be here for a time, and they'd be here at, at DLI studying a language, or they'd be here at NPS uh, doing officer training or doing a master's degree, or they'd be here as a student at one of the local schools, or they'd be here to work for a while. They'd become part of the church. we get to know them, and then when their time was done, they would just kind of disappear and just go to the next thing. And we, we said as a church, we don't want to do that. We want to actually honor people when they leave. So we made a coin that has our church logo and has Acts 1-8 on it. And we pray, when people are going to leave, we tell people every quarter, we say, if you're leaving in the next three or four months and you know you're leaving, meet with us at the end of the service. And here's what happens. We talk with each family, each individual. We pray with them. Sherry and I try to personally pray with every single family that's leaving here, every single individual person who's leaving here. We give them one of these coins and tell them to remember to pray for us and to go on mission. And then we give them a book about how to share your faith more effectively to encourage them to shine the light of Jesus wherever they go. And then we send them off with joy that we know God's calling them somewhere else. Welcome people warmly and say farewell when it's the right time. And do that well also. And there's times where there, there are times to simply say goodbye. And I, I, some years ago I said to Sherry, I had a friend I'd known for a lot of years. And I, I was thinking about, sometimes you evaluate your life and I was looking at this relationship. And I realized it struck me, I reach out to him all the time he never reaches out to me. I'm, it's like, like a sort of one way relationship. But I, I, just try, I care about him, I try to reach out to him every so often I'd kind of connect with him. But I said to Sherry, I wonder if I never if I never called him or checked in with him again. I wonder if I'd ever hear from him. And the time we lived 2,000 miles away. But I, I said, I wonder. And so it's been 15 years now about that. And I haven't heard from him. So you, well, that, that's terrible that you wouldn't care for your friend. No, it was a timing thing. I was looking at my life saying, I have really close friends I hardly have time to spend time with. And I'm pouring time into this relationship. Lord, is this the right relationship? And I really felt like just, let's just, let's find out and see. It wasn't bitterness. It was just kind of like, hey, it's a timing thing. That relationship isn't a good investment. It, there's times where things, you say goodbye to certain things, and that's part of the rhythm of life. So a question, who needs a warm welcome or an honoring farewell? Make sure you welcome people well. Make sure you say farewell with dignity and care and love, and know that it's okay to say goodbye sometimes. Ecclesiastes 3, 6 says this. There's a time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. There are times where searching after something, seeking for something, going after it is exactly the right thing to do. And there's times where you say, you know what? That's run its course, and I need to, I need to give up on that. And giving up at that point is a good thing, because in God's timing, you can spend your energy on something else. My wife has lost the diamond I gave her before we got married, our engagement diamond. She has lost it twice. She's never lost the ring, it's just that the diamond popped out, which is shocking because it's so large. Um, and um, when we got married, we, our first three years of marriage, our tax day every year would say to us, you still live below the poverty line, you still live below the poverty line. By the fourth year, he said, hey, you're above the poverty line. I said, really? He goes, yeah, but just barely. <laughs> and so when, before we got married, I was broke. So I bought her, it was a, it was a real diamond, it was a diamond. It was just petite, is what I'm trying to say. So anyway, so those little clamps, I guess, couldn't hold it very well. So one day at our home in Michigan, the diamond popped out. And she said, I think it popped out somewhere in the basement. And so she, she searched and searched and searched and searched and couldn't find it. But here's what she said, I know I'm going to find it. I know it's down here. I know I'm going to find it. And she kept this kind of searching mindset. Whenever she was down there, she kind of be looking around. And one day she was, she was sweeping some stuff up and she was going to sweep stuff into a dustpan and throw it away. And as she's sweeping the dustpan, there's like a glimmer. You know, something, just a little glimmer. 
Because this thing was huge. And so, so, so she looked, she got down really, really close. <laughs> and, she, and she found it. It was like incredible. The search paid off. And she actually went to the jeweler, and the jeweler put it back in and fortified it real nicely, the, the, the little prongs, whatever those things are called, and put it back in there. And then a couple of years ago, uh, Brandon, who was playing keyboard this morning, one of our, part of our church and great musician, Brandon was getting married to Megan down in Los Angeles. Sherry was able to go to the wedding, and while she was at the wedding, somewhere while she was down there in L.A., it popped out again, and it, she lost it again. Not her fault, it just popped out. And she didn't notice until she got home. She got home all, from L.A. back home, closed the door, and she said, she said, I put my hands on the door, I said, Lord, thank you for bringing me home safely, and she looked at her hand and saw the diamond was gone. She checked the car, it wasn't in the car, and she's like, and you know what? She gave up. She just goes, it's not, I'm, I'm not going to search because I can't go search all of Los Angeles, right? There was one that was a time to keep searching and one a time to give up. And so I explained to her, honey, you get one diamond in a lifetime. I'm sorry you lost it. That's your issue. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I surprised her with a, uh, I didn't know you could get diamonds smaller than the original one I got. No, that's not true. Uh, but I surprised her and she has a new diamond. And if she turns around just right, it blinds me. So I have to be very careful here when you're in the sunlight like this. Uh, but but, but here's, here's the lesson. We honor God when we learn the wisdom of letting go. There's times to search, but we can on, sometimes we honor God by saying, you know what? It's time. It might be a relationship that's really broken and really unhealthy. But they're there. And you feel like God is saying it's time to let that go, to start a new chapter. It could be a pattern. There's time to, to let it go. There's times where you simply say, uh, it might be a dream that you had. Yeah, maybe you have a person who said, I want to be a professional dancer. And they tried and tried and tried. And now it's, you know, you've gone past the 20s, and you're in your 30s, and your early 40s, you're going, like, that, there's a time where you go, you know what, my body is not the same as it was, that dancers that are going to be professional are, are in their 20s. And you say, you know what, Lord, is it, is it time? And there's times where we actually honor God by letting some things go. It, maybe that's the case for you. Maybe there's something that, that you would honor God by letting go. And so just, just ask, your, ask yourself that question. What do you need to let go of, even if it's painful? Sometimes it's hard and painful to let things go, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. Ecclesiastes 3, seven says this. A time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. And here's lesson number six. We honor God when we know the wisdom of silence. When we learn the wisdom of silence. There, there is something about learning to be quiet. This has been a long, hard lesson for me to learn. I make my living talking. I like to talk. But there's wisdom to silence. I love the proverb in the book of Proverbs that says, even a fool, when they remain silent, appears wise. Isn't that good? <laughs> but, but there's times where we need to learn to be quiet. Jesus asked four to five times more questions than he gave answers. Jesus was great about asking questions and listening. Sometimes when people ask Jesus a question, you know what he did? He didn't answer. You know what he did instead? He asked a question back. There's wisdom to asking questions, to listening. And so, and so here's, um, here, here's, a, here's a question for you. In what situation do you need to learn to speak less and listen more? In what circumstance, what situation of your life do you need to learn to speak less and listen more? And I'll give you a good answer to that question. Every situation, <laughs> almost every situation, if you were to say, hey, how are you doing? And you just listen. And as you're listening, you're not waiting for your chance to say your thing. You're just listening. Hey, how's it going for you? How'd that situation? And learning to talk less and listen more. And almost every relationship you have will strengthen that relationship. Listen for God's timing in that part of your life. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8. There's a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And lesson number seven, we honor God when we stand against evil with power and conviction. Followers of Jesus Christ need to stand against evil in this world with strength, with conviction, with confidence that we stand in the name of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of evil in this world. And there's a lot of evil that we battle against personally. So we have to recognize those battles. But here's what we have to realize, and this is God's timing. We don't have to fight every single battle personally. 
God has lots of people. He can call to lots of things. This, this last year, this last 14 months, there's been times where I felt like, man, I want to go to battle on something. And every time I'm feeling that, I pray, Lord, is this battle for me? And sometimes God says, step into that. And a lot of times God says, you stay focused on what I've called you to do. You can't do everything all the time in every situation. And so, and, and my, my natural temperament is one that I like, I like, I mean, if I see an injustice, if I see something, man, I want to go after it. But I also want to make sure I'm doing what God calls me to do. Because I can't do everything and neither can you. But you know what? All of God's people, if we'll listen for the things God calls us into, that we're ready to stand strong. There are spiritual battles. There are principalities and powers. Ephesians chapter 6 says, your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and p- powers, the forces of evil working in this present world. We have to be ready to stand and ready to fight and resist evil. So here's the question. Is there evil at work in your life, in your home, or in our world that God wants you to courageously stand against? Is there something in your life, something in your home, something in the community around you, the world that you say, that is, that is evil, it dishonors God, and God is calling me to stand, to fight, to go to war against that? And if God is calling you to, be faithful to the call. And if God is saying, not right now, then trust that God is big enough to send somebody else. But seek the Lord and ask the Lord to guide you. And then one last question. Are you ready to build the the rhythm of your life around the seasons and timing of the Lord and not your own whims and desires? Can you build your life around saying, God, what do you have for me? What are you doing? How are you moving? I just got a glimpse of a mom who had quadruplets. That's four kids at one time. Am I correct about that? In that season, you had worked for the CIA. You had worked, I mean, you'd done all kinds of, but in that season, what did you primarily focus on? I'm going to take a wild guess. Four little babies, right? Um, a season. But now there's other things. You know, there, there, there's God opened, every one of us has seasons. Will you seek the Lord and listen for his timing and, and step into what he calls you to do? Think about that farmer who's decided that they're going to plant seed in the middle of winter. They can do it. You can clear the snow, chisel the ground, and put seed in the ground. It's just not going to go very well. So, Lord, this is our prayer. Will you show us where you are leading us, where you are guiding us? Will you remind us that, that, that to have the greatest meaning in life is not only to do the right things, but to do them in your timing, to wait upon you, to listen to you, to follow you, And then, Lord, as we do that, to give you glory. And then to listen and wait on you again and again and again to stay in step with your spirit. Lead us, O Lord, to lives that are meaningful and rich and glorious and beautiful and fruitful because we're paying attention to the seasons and your movement and your leading. That we would know there's a time for everything under heaven. May we walk in your timing and see you do great things through that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of invitations. If you need prayer, if you have a joy, you want somebody to rejoice with you, or a burden that you want somebody to bear with you. Dennis, are you guys ready to share joys? Are you ready to share burdens? They're waiting to pray for you. So if you're here on campus, head right up there. If you are at home, you're going to see a phone number you can call to pray with someone live, or an email address where you can send us prayers and we'll pray throughout the week for you. If you're new at Shoreline, we're so glad you're here. If you're new, take a moment and head right back where those balloons are. Patty's back there. And we talked about giving warm welcomes. We want to give you the warmest welcome possible. We have a little gift for you. We want to answer your questions. So if you're on campus, go back and see Patty and her team at the Connections booth. And if you're online, you can just uh, send your... The word welcome to the number you see there, and we'll send you a connection card, and we'll do all we can to connect with you online and look forward to the day you can be here on campus with us. And then finally, the next three weeks on Wednesday nights, we have a class at 6.15 that will actually be on campus. So we're going to start some classes back on campus again, and it's a class uh, based on a book written by uh, uh, Pastor John Maxwell on communication. And if you want to grow in that area, it looks like it looks to be a great class. There's details on the website. You can go on the website and check that out. Uh, and so jump into that and register and come be part of that on the next three Wednesday nights. I want to ask you if you're able to stand, will you stand with me and give me the honor of sending you off with a word of blessing. And before I send you off with a word of blessing, remember if you're here uh, heading out and if you're not within six feet of people, you don't need the mask. If you're going to get within six feet of people, get super close. Let's still honor that. But if you're going to keep space from people, you're all good just to kind of Walk to your car and have a great day. But as you go from this place, will you go knowing that there is a time for everything, a season for everything under heaven? 
So walk in God's timing and follow him and honor him and watch what he does. Watch the fruit he bears and the joy he brings as you walk in step with his Holy Spirit. God bless you. Have a great week. And next week we'll come back and finish up our little mini-series here on the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll see you next week. God bless you.